Well, thank you for this invitation uh, and uh, this opportunity to speak on Edmund Ludlow as a Baptist regicide. Some uh, 20 years ago, at least, I was distributing the Bradford on Avon Church magazine, we called it The Messenger, in Bradford, and uh, arrived at a row of bungalows on the outskirts of the town, trim little houses, that you really wouldn't uh, anticipate any trouble. And uh, there are difficult areas to Bradford, as well as pleasant ones. And I called uh, at this this row of houses, and uh, there was an elderly gentleman in one of the gardens, and uh, I, a minister from the Baptist Church in Bradford. Oh, he said, you're the people that chopped off Charles I's head, aren't you? <laughs> so I said, uh, no, not quite. Uh, our church was actually formed 40 years after Charles I was executed. Well, he said, you are the sort of people that did it. That led on to quite a discussion about Puritanism, about independency, and uh, some of the issues that were involved in the Civil War and in the execution of the king. We eventually parted on friendly terms, and uh, I went on my way. I knew, of course, that both Baptists and independents had benefited from the greater freedom which came about as a result of the trial and execution of Charles I. And uh, I knew that as a result of the establishment of uh, a republican form of government, which is now known as the Commonwealth, that uh, the people I've mentioned, Baptists and Independents, enjoyed a measure of freedom that certainly would never have been countenanced by Anglicans and Presbyterians before the Civil War. But although my sympathies were with Parliament and with the parliamentary cause, I've always had difficulties with the execution of the King and the way in which he was put on trial. The problem arises from the fact that the Treasons Act of 1351 that people tend to appeal to when discussing this, uh, define treason as compassing or imagining the death of the king or his eldest son. Now, imagining there doesn't mean daydreaming. It means plotting. And um, the, 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 that is often quoted More recently, I had to revise my opinions, particularly after reading the Tyrannicide Brief by Geoffrey Robinson. Some of you may have read that. It's a a remarkable piece of work. Geoffrey Robinson is not an evangelical, far from it, but he he is actually a practicing barrister, a QC, and he was asked to examine the trial of King Charles I, Uh, which is is given usually um, very harsh treatment by writers. And uh, he came to the conclusion that by 17th century standards, the trial of the king was remarkably fair. And uh, instead of being rushed through in half a day, as happened with most treason trials, It was, in fact, it went on over a period of time. The king was given plenty of opportunity to argue his case, an opportunity he refused to take. And uh, there's far more to be said for what happened in the early weeks of 1649 than is often believed. Anyway, it's a fascinating biography. John Cook, the... uh, uh, the uh, lawyer who drew up the indictment against the king and conducted the prosecution was in fact a godly man. I've also since discovered that the Member of Parliament for Wiltshire at the time, Edmund Ludlow, who was also one of the king's judges, certainly gave indications of Baptist convictions later on, hence the title, A Baptist Regicide. 
So what I'd like to do this afternoon is to talk a little bit about uh, Edmund Ludlow himself and then his involvement in the trial of the king, his exile, and then his memoirs upon which so much of this depends. And finally, I want to say something about him as a Protestant nonconformist and almost certainly a Baptist by conviction, although so far uh, it's not been possible to discover whether he ever joined a Baptist church. But he certainly gave evidence of Baptist convictions. So let's begin with Edmund Ludlow. In the beautiful Wiley Valley, three and a half miles south of the garrison town of Warminster, you'll find a hamlet, Hill Deverell. A small place, but a parish in its own right until 1934, when it was merged with its bigger neighbour of Longbridge Deverell. It kept its own parish church until 1984, when that church was declared redundant and is now a private house. But the manor house is still there in Hill Deverell, and it was there that in 1617 Edmund Ludlow was born, the eldest son of Sir Henry Ludlow and his wife Elizabeth Nee Phillips, or Phillips. The Phillips family came from the magnificent mansion of Montacute in the adjoining county of Somerset. Some of you may well have visited Montacute, which is now a National Trust property, and it also uh, has uh, an extended exhibition of, uh, from the National Portrait Gallery, a permanent exhibition there. It's well worth the visit. Montacute. Now, several members of the Phillips family had risen to eminence as London lawyers. So there was a, a tradition of legal practice on Edmund's mother's side. The Ludlow family, on the other hand, had climbed over the previous 200 years from being humble domestic servants of King Henry IV, who died in 1413, to become significant Wiltshire landowners. Several times over that period, as they rose to eminence, members of the family had represented the county at Westminster. In 1633, Charles I appointed Sir Henry Ludlow as Lord High Sheriff of Wiltshire. Edmund must have been at that time finishing off his schooling in Blandford in the neighbouring county of Dorset. From there, he proceeded to Trinity College, Oxford, where he graduated as BA in 1636. Two years after that, he enrolled in the Inner Temple, one of the London Inns of Court, where he would receive the legal training that would be suitable for a landowner who could almost certainly expect to become a Justice of the Peace eventually. However, these were momentous times for England, and particularly for lawyers who were being faced with some big challenges Uh, in the whole way in which the law was being administered. Charles I was governing the country without a parliament, and that went on from 1629 to 1640. And uh, it's become known by by its description by parliamentarians as the 11 years' tyranny. It's interesting that uh, Geoffrey Robertson refers to tyrannicide rather than regicide. And the difficulty arising from ignoring Parliament arose from the fact that by long precedent, only the House of Commons could and still can vote taxation. Uh, That the kings had accepted since the Middle Ages, that new taxes must always be approved by the House of Commons. Now, in order to finance his government, the king had to find other ways of raising money, and a variety of expedients were adopted uh, to raise revenue for the exchequer. These included fines imposed for breaches of law which were long forgotten. Uh, One of the ways in which the king raised money was by implementing again the ancient forest laws, which uh, imposed fines if you were caught... uh, catching game in the king's forests. Now, 
the problem was, of course, the forests had changed their boundaries and uh, the king's lawyers were actually using Norman uh, boundaries for, uh, for, for the king's forests, some of which had long since been agricultural land with, with villages in and, uh, in, and that sort of method was used. Perhaps better known was the imposition of ship money. There was a long tradition that certain ports uh, contributed to the navy at first by sending ships and later on by paying a sum of money instead of sending ships. The king began to impose ship money on all of the towns in the country. On the, he argued, of course, that the navy defended all of the towns, not just the ports, and therefore they all ought to be paying this particular tax. And other methods were being used at this time to raise money. Now, in the eyes of loyal parliamentarians, such impositions were unconstitutional. But the king managed to get away with it until serious trouble arose in Scotland, and that forced him to turn again to Parliament for the resources that he needed to deal with a potential rebellion north of the border. And that had come about very largely because the king had backed his Archbishop William Lord in imposing a prayer book and a, a, a liturgy similar to the Anglican liturgy on the Church of Scotland. And so the Scots rose to defend their church, but Parliament was in no mood to cooperate with the king until he redressed a whole list of grievances that they had. And increasingly bitter disputes between king and Parliament eventually led to civil war. Parliament was deeply divided between a minority that wanted to uphold the rights of the king and a majority, certainly in the Commons, that insisted that Parliament's position must be upheld. Now, Edmund's father, Sir Henry Ludlow, Member of Parliament at the time, was a zealous parliamentarian. So it's not surprising that his son, having finished at the Inner Temple, enlisted in the parliamentary army as an officer under the Earl of Essex. He played a significant part in the Civil War in Wiltshire, which was one of the counties that backed Parliament right from the outset, although it was quickly overrun by Royalist forces, but then regained for Parliament later on in the, in the war. But during this period, in 1646, Sir Henry died, and almost immediately, Edmund was elected as one of the two members of Parliament for the county of Wiltshire. And so um, Edmund now found himself at the centre of affairs before eventually, because of his military experience, he was sent to command the army in Ireland in the early 1650s. But before that happened, he was caught up in the events which surrounded the execution of the king. Now, we don't know when Ludlow became a believer, but it's likely that this happened while he was still a young man. Certainly, before he became a member of Parliament, he was identified with the Puritan party. And his political development is, in fact, a little bit clearer. Edmund's father's loyalty to Parliament was so obnoxious to Charles I that when at one stage in the Civil War he offered an amnesty to the citizens of Wiltshire if they would lay down their arms, uh, he excluded Henry Ludlow, Edmund's father, from uh, a dozen or so, including a dozen or so men who would have been excluded from the amnesty. Now, Edmund's legal training undoubtedly impressed upon him that no citizen was above the law. Charles I, on the other hand, claimed at his trial that a king cannot be tried by any superior jurisdiction on earth. The royalist claim was therefore that the head of state cannot be put on trial and is above the law. Now this is a, a point which is still subject to some debate by the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648, which uh, England was not a signatory to, but it was a, 
it ended the Thirty Years' War on the continent of Europe, which really convulsed the centre of Europe. But by that treaty, a prince may not be overthrown for violating the rights of his own subjects. And that was the position that uh, Charles I took. But on the other hand, the parliamentarians had come to the conclusion that although the Treason Act, what I referred to earlier, defines treason as conspiring against the king, that was simply the inclusion of a crime in the... Uh, in, un, as treason in, in a whole body of law which had existed long before that. And they also argued that the sovereign at his coronation had promised to uphold the rights of his subjects by solemn oath. And so the, the, the question really is, could the king be put on trial? The king was defeated in the war. Could he be put on trial? And if so, could he be found guilty? And of course, uh, this has come up again and again. Came up, the question came up at the time of the Nuremberg trials after the Second World War, and more recently in the cases of General Pinochet and Slobodan Milosevic, both appealed to the Westphalian ideal that you can't call a head of state to, to book of the, the, the acts that he carried out as head of state. Back to Charles. After the Battle of Naseby in 1645, it was evident that the king had been defeated and it was only a matter of time before he surrendered. He, in fact, did so to the Scots in 1646. He then began to negotiate with the Scots but seems to have believed that if he could spin out the negotiations, his opponents would in fact fall out among themselves. So he played for time. He delayed a settlement so long that the Scots eventually handed him over to Parliament, and Parliament itself began to negotiate a settlement with the king that would include suppression of the various sects represented in the army which were now enjoying a de facto liberty of worship and propagation. They again, the Parliament began to negotiate. But while he was discussing terms, the army stepped in uh, dis and discovered that he was also negotiating a secret agreement with the Scots. Remember, Scotland was a distinctly separate kingdom with its own Parliament at this time, and the Scottish proposals were that the king would accept a Scottish army to put him back on the throne and Presbyterianism would be imposed on England for three years. So the king was actually negotiating in all sorts of different ways at the same time in an attempt to get back. In November 1647, he escaped from the custody of the army went to the Isle of Wight, which he hoped to make the basis of a return to power, and that was a signal for a cavalier rising in many areas of England and a Scottish invasion of the North West, uh, known as the Second Civil War. And only the prompt action of Cromwell and his new model army, together with the armies under General Fairfax in the South East, saved the day for Charles's opponents. Cromwell conducted a rapid campaign in Wales, then marched north to cross the Pennines and inflict a defeat on the Scots at Preston in August 1648. But now the increasing number of independent and Baptist churches appearing across the land were fearful that Parliament would try even yet to introduce laws that would curb their freedom. The Presbyterian majority in Parliament now negotiated with Charles and it seemed that a settlement between these men, the Presbyterians in Parliament, and the king would include suppression of what were described as the sects. In other words, independents, Quakers, Baptists, various other groups which had sprung up in this period. Charles, on the, on the other hand, was not only negotiating with 
various groups in his own country. But he was hoping for French assistance, and he told his close friends not to pay any attention to any agreements that he signed with anyone. To the Queen, he said, and the Queen was now in exile in France, he told the Queen that he had no intention of reaching an agreement with Parliament, but was playing for time. Until the outbreak of that Second Civil War, Edmund seems to have been amongst those who hoped for a peaceful negotiated settlement between King and Parliament. But to achieve this, uh, King and Parliament would have to agree to define their, the limits of their position, their roles in the life of the nation. It was the Second Civil War that shattered these hopes and the army leaders became convinced that the king must be brought to trial. If he were not brought to trial, there was a danger of yet a third civil war. And so it was that uh, the uh, army ordered the arrest of the king and his transfer to safe custody in Hurst Castle near Southampton. General Fairfax arranged a purge of parliament which excluded MPs who wanted to negotiate with the king. And it was that purged House of Commons that made arrangements to put Charles on trial. So I move on to consider Edmund Ludlow and the trial of the king, which took place in the early weeks of 1649 and led on to the king's conviction and execution at the end of January. Many years after these events, while he was in exile in Switzerland, Edmund Ludlow wrote his memoirs. And these give important light on his understanding of the situation and also his Christian convictions, although their full significance has only recently appeared. When they were first published after Ludlow's death, they appeared in 1698. Ludlow died in 1692. It was clear that he, Ludlow was a politician and a soldier with a passion for political and religious freedom and convinced that power in the hands of one man was dangerous. But recent research has indicated that religious convictions were fundamental to his political beliefs. He explained his change of attitude to the king. The Lord, he says, having hardened the king's heart as Pharaoh's, that he might make his power known upon him, refused to consent to the propositions that were sent to him by the Scots, the army, and the parliament, the latter having applied themselves to him several times, which yet prevailed not with him but caused him to be more high and proud, the consequence of which was sad and dangerous, for it occasioned a second civil war. Strong concept of God's sovereignty and a realisation that the king is somebody who can't be trusted. And then he goes on to explain how the decision was taken to put Charles on trial. Those of Parliament, writes Ludlow, and the army who minded the public interest and had respected the blood that had been shed, both of their friends and their enemies, looked upon it as their duty to hearken unto this and other loud voices of the Lord's providence so as to bring the author of so much blood, the king, to justice as a tyrant, traitor, murderer, and enemy to the Commonwealth of England, wherein the Lord was pleased to strengthen the hearts and hands of all who acted therein, who thought it was best that as he had sinned openly, so he should be tried, sentenced, and executed in the face of the world, and not secretly made away by poisoning and other private deaths, as in Scotland and other parts of the world, other kings, far less offenders, had been treated. That was probably a reference to the king's grandfather, Henry Darnley, husband of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was in fact murdered, um, probably with the queen's connivance. 
But notice Ludlow's emphasis on providence in that quotation. Persuaded that Charles could not be trusted and that his behaviour had caused unnecessary bloodshed, he agreed to take part in the proceedings against the king and was one of the signatories to the king's death warrant when he was finally found guilty. After the execution of Charles in January 1649, the monarchy and the House of Lords were abolished and England was declared to be a commonwealth or free state. The country was to be governed by a council of state of 41 members elected by parliament every year. It was to carry out executive duties by a series of committees. Lawmaking remained the responsibility of parliament but there was, a, there was an urgent situation that had to be dealt with. Rebellion in Ireland still had to be suppressed and the Scots resented the activities uh, leading up to the execution of the king. Cromwell was sent over to Ireland to subdue the royalists but eventually called away to deal with the situation in Scotland. Then Ludlow was sent to Ireland to complete the work as Lieutenant General. Now, while Ludlow was out of England uh, working in Ireland, it became evident that the system of government, the Commonwealth system, just wasn't working. It was too unwieldy. Cromwell had hoped that the rump would dissolve itself and call for new elections. When it failed to do so, he led a band of soldiers into the House of Commons chamber and dissolved what was left of the... Parliament, the rump parliament, and power fell into the hands of the army with Cromwell at its head. Ludlow disapproved of this. Ludlow always believed that it was wrong for the country to be ruled by a single person. So that, for that reason, he later opposed the appointment of Cromwell as law protector. He was recalled from Ireland and for some years lived in retirement, no longer in favour with Cromwell. However, the situation changed again in September 1658. Cromwell was succeeded, uh, Cromwell died, was succeeded by his son Richard, whose rule only lasted a few months. After the fall of Richard Cromwell, a new council of state was appointed. It was an attempt to go back to the original (coughs) Commonwealth situation which had obtained after the execution of the king. Again, Ludlow was asked to take command of the army in Ireland. He accepted because the Committee of Safety declared their intention should to be that the nation should be governed by way of a commonwealth without a king, single person or house of lords. Sadly, while he was in Ireland, further confusion in England gave an opportunity for the commander of the forces in Scotland, General Monk, to intervene. Uh, He announced that he would restore order. He marched south and announced that he would restore order and open discussions about a form of government. This led to the restoration of the long parliament, the parliament as it had existed prior to the purge of 1648, Such members have still uh, survived and any elections that have taken place since. And uh, the the, the Long Parliament was restored and sadly in this situation the parliamentarians were so deeply divided that Monk was able to exploit the situation in his own interest. Although he posed as a Commonwealth man He was in secret negotiations with Charles Stuart, exiled son of Charles I, who was living in the Netherlands. And so we come on to Ludlow's exile. Events were moving quickly in a totally unexpected direction. By 1660, Puritans and parliamentarians were hopelessly divided and betrayed by the treachery of General George Monk They were outwitted by the royalists who made vague offers to the Presbyterians and thereby secured the parliamentary restoration of the Stuart monarchy in 
in the person of Charles II, eldest son of Charles I. Many sincerely hoped for a fresh start with old scores forgotten. Some Puritans, led by Thomas Manton, Richard Baxter, Edmund Calamy, hoped to negotiate a much broader church settlement which would include moderate Presbyterians as well as Episcopalians. Politicians of various opinions scrambled for favours. There were promises of an act of indemnity and oblivion to cover past divisions. But it soon became apparent that even though many who fought against Charles I would be treated as not guilty, those who were directly involved in the trial and the execution of the king could expect no mercy. They were described as regicides and were to be charged with treason. In a preliminary address to a grand jury in 1660, Sir Orlando Bridgman, the king's lawyer, claimed, The king can do no wrong. That is a rule of law. It is frequently found in our law books. If a king can do no wrong, he cannot be punished for any wrong. These sinister words were reflected in the revenge that was exacted. Some two dozen of the regicides were seized and after show trials presided over by Bridgman, they were butchered to death. Others who had already died were disinterred and their corpses subjected to mock trials and infamous treatment. These included Oliver Time, the bodies of Oliver Cromwell's deceased mother and sister, neither of whom had played any part in the politics of the 1640s, were used in the same vile fashion. By 1660, the cause of the regicides was clearly lost, and generally, history has not treated them kindly. A partial exception has been made in the case of Oliver Cromwell, who has since been more widely appreciated. More recently, the researches of Geoffrey Robinson, Robertson have shown that by 17th century standards, the trial of the king was fair and that the prosecutors were careful to proceed by rule of law in contrast to the manner in which they themselves were treated by Bridgman and his cronies. What has gone unmarked is the spirituality of some of the men who suffered at this time. Although he was a member of Parliament and seemingly enjoying immunity, at the time of the Restoration, Ludlow soon realised that he was amongst those in danger. As we've seen, he had been a member of the court and signatory of the death warrant for Charles I. Like many of his associates, he believed he'd acted in the best interests of the country. As the arrests began, Ludlow felt the net closing round him and he was able to escape across the Channel. He went into exile in Switzerland, which he, he believed will be a a safer haven for Commonwealth men than either France or the Netherlands. In that, he was correct. Uh, a number of arrests took place abroad in the Netherlands, uh, particularly engineered by a man called George Downing, after whom Downing Street is, is in fact, na- um, is named. Actually, the, the Prime Minister's residence is George Downing's house. And uh, Downing managed to round up people and there were even men assassinated in Switzerland. But Ludlow was able to escape. Uh, He was protected by uh, by the Swiss authorities and there he wrote his memoirs. And it's at the time of his exile that Ludlow writes more about his religious convictions. Although throughout this, uh, throughout the... The extract from uh, the voice, it's clear that he writes from a strong Christian position. His escape route took him through France, uh, Roman Catholic France, of course, where the government of Louis XIV was sympathetic to the Stuart cause and the English authorities had agents. He had some difficulty in Paris avoiding bowing to the host, 
carried the Roman Catholic uh, communion elements which were being carried in a religious procession. His convictions forbade him to, uh, to bow, and that put him in some danger. But leaving Paris without serious problems, he joined a group of French and German travellers going to Switzerland. He writes, as all of them, as far as I could guess by their discourse about the Popish religion, at least not of the Reformed, and they were pressing me very earnestly to find out what my judgment was. And finding that I was not of theirs, they were no less desirous to find out if I were a Lutheran or a Calvinist. I telling them that I was for both as far as they agreed with the word of God, and for neither any further. This gentleman who questioned me, whom I took to be a Frenchman, presently cried out, He's a Quaker, a Quaker, (laughs) to whom I replied, I was desirous to be one who trembled at the word of God. By this time, Ludlow was afraid that one of the members of this party was a Jesuit who would report them to the French authorities. As they approached Lyon, he was told that the names of all the travellers had to be reported to the governor. But passing into the city in a crowd, he was able to avoid detection. And from Lyon to Geneva, he says that he enjoyed the company of two of the Reformed religion to balance the young man whom I took for a Jesuit. Soon in Genevan territory, he was filled with gratitude to God in that I had a great love and inclination for the heir of a commonwealth, but for that I hoped to enjoy the society of mankind, but above all, the servants and ordinances of Christ. Reflecting on his safe arrival, he wrote, The Lord hid me in the hollow of his hand. Oh, that I might be so affected therewith as to sacrifice the remainder of my life to his praise and service. Quickly, he moved on to writing his memoirs. He didn't stay in Geneva. He went on to a small place called Veve between Geneva and Lausanne. Several editions of the memoirs that appeared in 1698 appeared before what until recently has been considered to be the definitive edition of the memoirs. It appeared in two volumes in 1894 and was edited by one of those great Victorian historians, Sir Charles Firth. Now, Firth felt that the earlier editions were inadequate and discovered that uh, there were extracts from the memoirs <coughs> in the writings of John Locke, the philosopher. And he therefore integrated the Locke quotations into his edition of the memoirs. So he felt now he really arrived at what was the definitive work. But in the last 30 years, a considerable section of the memoirs, not all of them, but a considerable section... Was, has been discovered in the library of Warwick Castle. The writing is that of a professional scribe, but there are numerous corrections in Ludlow's own hand. And it's this section of memoirs which parts company from the early printed editions. <coughs> Clearly, the first printed edition was subjected to considerable revision before it came out in 1698. And for further light, we are indebted to the researches of Professor A.B. Worden of Royal Holloway College, London. Now, Professor Worden has transcribed and published a section of the Warwick Castle manuscript under its original title, which was never used in the earlier ones, A Voice from the Watchtower. It's nothing to do with Jehovah's Witnesses. It's, uh, it is, in fact, the, the, the memoirs of, uh, of Ludlow from 1660 to 1662. So covering a fairly short period, you can see it's a substantial piece of work, even allowing for Worden's editorial work as well. And whoever edited the earlier work, carefully remove most of the religious content 
in which Ludlow is continually appealing to scripture and seeking to see the hand of God in events. Worden writes, the contrast between the Ludlow of the memoirs, which is the the big two-volume Sir Charles Firth one, and the Ludlow of the manuscript is no more more vividly displayed than in the treatment of the uh, documents of the execution of Charles I's judges in 1660 and 1662. In uh, Worden's words, the... In the memoirs, the regicides die like Romans. In the manuscript, those poor innocent lambs of Christ, which is Ludlow's description of them, meet their deaths like early Christian martyrs. And uh, Worden considers that Ludlow was really concerned to do what John Fox had done for the earlier martyrs in the reign of Mary I. So the question then arises, well, who worked over the memoirs and why were they worked over? Worden considers that the changes were probably the work of a deist, John Toland, 1670-1722. Now, Toland was an early Whig pamphleteer, a bitter critic of orthodox Christianity, a deist, but he found useful material in Ludlow to support the Whig cause at the end of the century. Geoffrey Robertson has commented on the Whig liberal mindset. Whigs, says Robertson, were liberals entranced by the civil war and the victory of Parliament, but embarrassed by the execution of the king, which was put down to cruel necessity and quickly passed over, as in consequence was the trial of the regicides. Ludlow, on the other hand, had a nonconformist readership in view. And... uh, He speaks of his friends, and they included prominent Puritan names, Vavasor Powell, Nicholas Lockyer, Ralph Venning, Thomas Brooks, William Bridge, Edward Bagshaw, Henry Jesse, Henry Wilkinson, Praise God Barebone, and Walter Fimmelton. Significant Puritan names familiar to many members of this conference, and of course Henry Jesse is known as an early Baptist pioneer. So, what about Ludlow then, uh, the Protestant nonconformists? Well, he collected reports of the trials and executions of his former colleagues as they began to filter through to Switzerland. He was in correspondence with his wife, who joined him in 1663, but he had other friends who kept him in touch with English affairs. He wrote detailed accounts which indicate something of his own understanding of experimental religion. In detail, he records the testimony of Major General Harrison, who suffered many indignities during his trial. Blessed be the Lord, says Ludlow, his soul was above their reach, being carried above the fear of death, as it is recorded of the martyrs of old, Hebrews 11.34. In Harrison's final speech, Ludlow records that he said that he'd found the way of God to be a perfect way, his word a perfect word, and he a buckler to those who trust in him, assuring them that though the people of God might suffer hard things, yet the end would be for his glory and his people's good, and therefore he encouraged them to be cheerful in the Lord, to hold fast that which they had, and not be afraid of sufferings, for God would make bitter things sweet and hard things easy. And that notwithstanding the cloud that was now upon them, the sun would shine, and God would give a testimony to what they had been doing in a short time. Well, we haven't time to examine all of the testimonies recorded by Ludlow. That of John Cook merits a special attention as among the regicides, he was probably the closest friend of Edmund Ludlow. He was the lawyer who drew up the indictment against the king. The two men had served in Ireland together, and there are frequent references to Cook in this fragment of the voice. Ludlow paid tribute to Cook. This chief, this person, Chief Justice Cook, in his younger days, travelled through France and Italy, and being at Rome spoke freely on behalf of the Reformed religion, and so far discovered his 
zeal that no endeavours were wanting to draw him over to own the popish interest. But he, as enlightened from above, was not the least shaken by their temptation. Residing for some time at Geneva, at the house of Mr. Diodat, he was observed to live a very strict and pious life and be a constant frequenter of public ordinances. He was appointed solicitor by and to the High Court of Justice for the trial of the king without any knowledge or seeking of his, and was taken by Lieutenant Cromwell with him into Ireland and appointed Chief Justice of Munster. Ludlow reports Cook's speech at the scaffold, where Cook said the most glorious sight that was ever seen in this world was our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, and next to that is the most, it is the most glorious sight to see any poor creature suffer in his cause. He blessed God for the peace that he found in his soul through the application of the blood of Christ for sanctification, professing himself to be ready to bear a testimony to God and Jesus Christ for justice, truth, righteousness and holiness. He cleared himself of having any malice towards jury, court or king or any man living, but said he, poor as we have been bought and sold by our brethren as Joseph was, brother has betrayed brother to death and that scripture is in great measure fulfilled. However, I desire to kiss the rod. He professed that his faith was founded on the rock Christ and he expected not salvation for anything that he did, but he laid hold on Christ as a naked Christ and there placed his soul. He professed further that he had, through grace, endeavoured to do that which might be to God's glory to the best of his understanding. He professed himself to be in the fellowship of the gospel of the congregational way and for liberty of conscience to all who walk humbly and lowly before the Lord. One death recorded by Ludlow is that of a largely forgotten Baptist, John James, who was not a regicide. Of James, whose grave can still be identified in Bunhill Fields, Ludlow records, records this confederacy of wicked men, imbrued with their hands in the blood of a precious servant of the Lord, one John James, a citizen of London, who was accused of having affirmed in his prayer at a public meeting that Charles Stewart the present usurper was a tyrant and guilty of the blood of the saints. The witness who was to be made use of in this tragedy, being checked in his own conscience, resolved to fly beyond the seas, and being to that end got as far as Dover, was sent back by Robinson, the jailer of the tower. And when that scene was prepared, Foster, that bloodthirsty wretch, and the rest of his brethren on the bench, Four of the tyrant's bloodhounds at the bar worrying this poor innocent lamb. This witness being produced could not say that he, the said John James, then prisoner at the bar, was the person who spoke these words whereof he was accused. The witness not seeing the person accused at that time that they were spoken. Whereupon they so threatened the witness in court and the counsel so handled him in private that being brought again into the court, he confidently affirmed that he was the man who spoke these words. But John James denied the words in the manner that they were testified against him, and alleged that if any such words were used, it was before the act of indemnity was passed. And using the words of Jeremiah the prophet, he said to them, As for me, I am in your hands. Do unto me as seemeth good and meet to you, but know for certain." If you put me to death, you shall surely bring innocent blood upon your heads. Well, the James's wife appealed to Charles the First for uh, Charles the Second uh, for a reprieve, but the king threw the petition over his shoulder, saying, "He's a rogue and shall be hanged." And so this poor man, scarce able to get a livelihood by his trade of ribbon weaving, yet rich in faith, finished his testimony, being hanged for the same. 
The sentence of hang, drawing and quartering took place at Tyburn in November 1661. But unlike the regicides, he was given a decent burial and, as I say, his grave in Bunhill Fields can still be seen. Now, Ludlow obviously had some connection with John James and, and some, some knowledge of him and sympathy for him. References, too, to John Cook's churchmanship uh, are indications of his own ecclesiology. The explanation of his ecclesiology is more explicit in a section of the voice which has not yet been published. Unfortunately, I've not been able to examine this section of the manuscript, but Professor Worden has supplied more information in his introduction to the published section. Ludlow, he tells us, was profoundly grateful for the refuge in the reformed cantons of Switzerland, but mourned the state of religion in Geneva that had played such an important part in the Reformation. He wrote, I dare not as guiltless cast a stone against this city, neither in doctrine or discipline, principle or practice. They have made such progress as since the time of the First Reformation as might have been hoped for, but they have rather, sorry, they have not made such progress as might have been hoped for, but have rather gone backwards and brought forth sour grapes. And he explained what was happening. Freedom to communicate in that holy ordinance of the Lord's Supper of persons of whom we have not a particular satisfaction of a work of grace in their hearts and a conversational way of life suitable thereto, a visible church consisting of living stones to wit of believers, by communicating with such in this ordinance in our judgment, we contribute to their sin and consequently to their punishment, such eating and drinking their own damnation. So, Worden ascribes these views to the influence of Jean de Labadie, who was ministering in Geneva at this time. De Labadie was a former Roman Catholic priest who spent a few years in Switzerland before removing to the United Provinces, where he caused a disturbance by setting up home Bible study groups and prayer meetings and pressing for clear evidence of regeneration in the hearts of would-be communicants. But as far as is known, Labadie was a Baptist, both in Geneva and in the United Provinces. Ludlow, on the other hand, wrote in his memoirs, nothing is more expressed in scripture that none but believers were the subjects of water baptism. There is at present no known reference to Ludlow being baptised as a believer in England, Ireland or abroad. It's not clear when he reached Baptist convictions, but certainly his understanding of the doctrine of the church is in harmony with that of the first London Baptist Confession of 1646. Writing of the state in England while he was in exile, he deplored the spread of Arminianism, Notably, the growth of that opinion touching universal grace of Christ dying for all, a doctrine which have, would have salvation depend on the sandy foundation of our own merits. Throughout this period, Ludlow continued to trust in God, and he believed that a time would come when God would restore freedom to his fellow believers in England. But he believed also that fruitless division and striving for power, even among the godly, have brought about much of the, the suffering that they had at that time. Sadly, freedom of conscience was not widely appreciated during the Commonwealth. Maybe men like Ludlow were partly to blame. It was Cromwell who strove to maintain freedom of conscience, but Ludlow and his associates would, could never give him the support that the wider interests of the gospel needed. Independents suspected independence, and both suspected Presbyterians who had un tried so hard to, but unsuccessfully, to negotiate a deal with the Laudians 
at the Restoration. Failure and division meant that the settlement made between 1660 and 1662 was so painful for the Puritans. His political convictions were supported only by a small minority of his fellow citizens and it will be easy to dismiss Ludlow as one of the failures of history. The Commonwealth, he idealised, was never a practical possibility. His doctrine of the church, although during his lifetime that of a persecuted minority, was, however, to be widely accepted in the centuries after his death. However, against many of his corrupt contemporaries, he stands out as a man of integrity, an integrity sustained by his Christian conviction. He feared God and desired to be governed by his infallible word. He was a keen observer of providence, but scripture was his ultimate guide, and surely he deserves that scriptural commendation that he was a faithful man and feared God more than men.